Well, I'm, I'm sad like everyone else at the loss, but more so I'm not necessarily mourning. I'm celebrating a life, a life of 96 years of love with President Carter and 96 years of service to the American people and people all over the globe. She did unprecedented things that other first ladies hadn't touched yet and brought some of the subjects like mental illness and things that we've talked about tirelessly. Uh, this is a woman who, who celebrated even a more uh, prolific post-White House life than nearly every other first lady in history. And the advantage and the power of the Carters was the power of two, because they're virtually inseparable in life, personal and professional, and in their public service. How do you think she shaped the role of a first lady, not just while uh, she was in office, but then the role of a first lady or a first couple once they leave office? Well, typically, a first lady will pick a cause or a couple causes. Uh, Mrs. Carter seemed tireless. Of course, she started out with mental health, as we mentioned. And mental mm -hmm. health is a key because no one else was talking about it at this point. It's kind of like right. Betty Ford was talking about breast cancer and addiction when people didn't talk about that. Mrs. Carter talked about a subject that was taboo, a subject that was in the closets, swept under the carpet. And by bringing that out in light and making it acceptable just to talk about, that would be enough. But she went on to be on board of directors and part of uh, 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 symposiums and associations with psychological and mental health and medical and journalistic writing of mental health. She really just stopped at nothing to get this issue out there and improved upon. And why was it that she grabbed onto that particular issue? I think it was something that she recognized that wasn't getting the attention that it needed and something that was very serious, mm -hmm. like addiction or cancer or something like that. But no one was championing this very, very important issue mm -hmm. that continues to plague us in society today. Right. And sh there would be no discussions about this like we're having today or help that we would have if Mrs. Carter hadn't opened up the door and started the conversation. And then, of course, all the humanitarian work that she and her husband did once they left office. Habitat for Humanity. I mean, we saw the Carters in not the best physical condition, still wearing tool belts and swinging hammers and wearing hard hats. I've been to Plains. I know the family. I know the, the community. I know the, the, the relatives. It's such a wonderful community, a wonderful town, and the support group down there that has always championed these efforts and pitched in. But this goes across the country. This goes around the globe of people that really could get on board because the, the Carters were so sincere and their work was walking the walk and talking the talk. And like I say, swinging the hammers and things like Habitat for Humanity. And that can't help but be infectious. And you want to contribute and help given their efforts. I thought that Jimmy Carter's tribute was so lovely this weekend when he said that as long as she was alive, I knew that somebody loved me. And also uh, making sure to point out that all of his successes were her successes too, because she was there with him every step of the way. They're really, you know, I, I've studied every first lady, Martha Washington, through Dr. Jill Biden. And I've always tried to separate those women from their husband's accomplishments and take them on their own. There's no separating Rosalind and President Carter. Even now in death, they're still together. There, there's no separation here. And the two have been together 77 years married. But also, she supported all his efforts and his philanthropies and his political and personal aspirations. And he did the same for her, always giving each other credit for the work that each of them did on their own and then celebrating the work that they did together. And you knew her later in life. Talk a little bit about what that relationship was like and what her personality was like behind the scenes. One of the nicest ladies I've ever met, really. I, I, I was with her and the family on her birthday last year in Plains, Georgia. And I was honored to be able to give her a signed set of my books for her birthday. I, I gave her the book. She said, thank you so much. I told her a little bit about the C-SPAN project. She had done an interview for the C-SPAN series that I produced with a team of incredible people there at C-SPAN and the White House Historical Association. But the purpose of the event was to dedicate this butterfly statue, 18 butterflies on the statue, beautifully done by a sculptor named Peter Hazel, 18 to represent the 18th of August when she was born. And mm -hmm. her sister, Alethea, took her over with her walker to light the statue for the first time. I was just trying to stay out of the way. And as she was walking past lighting it, she looked over and saw me again. And she reached over and she grabbed my hand so tenderly, 
but firmly, still strong in her 90s, had a good grip on me and mm -hmm. said, thank you so much for being here. And I said, Mrs. Carter, thank you for so much and for everything that you've done and happy birthday. And she thanked me again. And then we enjoyed the rest of the barbecue together with the folks down there in Plains and, and had a lovely afternoon and evening together. Wow, that's a beautiful memory. So glad you got to have that experience with her last year. Andrew Oak, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us more about Rosalind Carter. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Nancy. Yeah.